welcome back. We're here at the World Healthcare Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm Mabel Jong, and it's so great to have my annual check-in with Chet Burrell, President and CEO of Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield. Always a great chance to see great you, Great pleasure Chet. to be here and to see you again, Mabel. Yes, you've been busy? Very. Yes. <laughs> Couldn't and, be busier. And what's been keeping you so busy, Chet? It's a combination of things. We are very focused on the Affordable Care Act and how to deal with all the twists and turns there, mm -hmm. and I can fill you in on that. Mm -hmm. And we've been working further on our patient-centered medical home, and that has actually produced very encouraging results. Mm -hmm. um, and then a whole array of other things. We've sponsored some innovations in healthcare that we think have long-term applicability to controlling cost and improving quality. Mm -hmm. So it's been on a number of different fronts. Sure. Back to the ACA for a moment. Um, some of the issues that you're dealing with were left over from the former administration yes. and coming through to the current administration. Do you feel that you're any closer to addressing the most pressing needs of, of the ACA? I would say yes and no. <clears throat> yes, from the standpoint of some state action that has occurred, that has actually, I think, helped and or will help, mm -hmm. and I'll describe that. Mm -hmm. No, from the standpoint of federal policy. I think um, there's been a lot of actions taken at the federal level that have actually hurt the performance of ACA, maybe intended to do so. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's a mixed bag. Yes. And we have taken in our own region the bulk of the enrollment that has come in through the exchanges or individually directly to us. Um, so we have been the dominant carrier and, in, and for all of the years of ACA. Mm -hmm. So if you've been in that position, you learn a thing or two about what it takes to support this population. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> a couple of observations I'd make is that if you ask the simple question, did ACA work? Mm -hmm. My answer to that would be yes. Mm -hmm. Why would I say that? Because it brought insurance coverage to bear for 30 million Americans who otherwise wouldn't have had it. Mm -hmm. And generally speaking, they were um, in need. They absolutely needed the coverage. And they were, so they were somewhat sicker. And they were generally uh, of less income. And so it reached a population that otherwise would never have been reached, which was the core intent of ACA. Mm -hmm. So from that standpoint, to say that in a few years' time, coverage for 30 million Americans, principally through an expansion of Medicaid and through the commercial market, through the exchanges, um, very important populations were reached and the overall uninsured rate in the country dropped dramatically and dropped most dramatically for those low income and truly in need of the coverage. I would say that's a remarkable Absolutely. accomplishment Absolutely. by any yardstick. Mm -hmm. Now, are there flaws? Yes, there are flaws. Mm -hmm. uh, principal among them, I think there are two. One was that really high cost claims, uh, by that I mean when somebody has more than $20,000 a year in claims, you're really sick. Um, the, the, the reinsurance that was provided through ACA, in other words, the coverage for those really high cost claims, ceased after three years. Mm -hmm. And that had an effect on premiums to drive premiums up because they weren't covered. Mm -hmm. And the faster the premiums went up, the faster the healthier people dropped out because they said, I can't afford this and I'm gonna take my chances. Mm -hmm. Whereas the sicker people stayed in because they said, we, I can't not have this coverage. <clears throat> Had there been better reinsurance protection, it would have stabilized the market. That would be one flaw. Mm -hmm. A second flaw was the amount of out-of-pocket expense to people, uh, particularly people who did not get subsidies, was very high. Okay. And that discouraged access to care. But okay. those are fixable things. Mm -hmm. And any large program, especially as large as this one is, would require typically um, modification after you have real world experience with it. Mm -hmm. And that just wasn't done. Chet, any concern or any observation on your part that those covered lives, would their insurance be threatened given the climate that we're in right Definitely. now? Definitely. Mm -hmm. Without so, a shadow of a doubt. So where does that bring us to then? What do you see happening then? Well, I think the first thing it does is it causes states to want to take some action. So if the federal government won't, 
the states are more inclined, and, the fed, and the, at the federal level, the Trump administration has said they want greater flexibility for the states. Um, in our particular area, for example, Maryland took the step of creating its own reinsurance pool with an eye towards stabilizing the market, just the way I described. Mm -hmm. That will take effect for 2019. That's a very positive development. Mm -hmm. um, the state has applied for a waiver of certain rules that would enable them to get the funding, and we're hopeful that they'll get the success from the federal level, that they will get a, an answer, a positive answer. Um, so there is state initiative going on. <clears throat> um, at the federal level, we see a series of policies that we think undermine the market. Mm -hmm. So for example, uh, short-term policies that formerly were there for only three months, you could get coverage on a transitional basis, mm -hmm. have now been extended to a year and made them renewable and loosen the requirements of ACA in terms of coverage. Mm -hmm. Well, that might be attractive to young people, but if the young people are even more enticed after the loss of the individual mandate and so on, to leave the ACA market, then it will you know, increase the right. premiums for everybody else. Sure. That's a worrisome uh, development. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> on the flip side, you're doing some great work on the medical homes uh, initiatives. Tell me yeah, the we, update uh, it, on that. It's fundamental to who we are and what we've tried to do to improve overall quality and cost. Eight years ago, it seems hard to believe, yeah. I think when we, when when we, we had our met. first discussion, yes. yeah, um, we started the program. It's, it's throughout our region, covers Northern Virginia, all of Maryland and D.C. Same model. Um, basically what it is is a program built through primary care physicians okay. who are held accountable and who are incented to get a better overall outcome for the people who chose them as their primaries. Not just for primary care, but for all care in all settings. Mm -hmm. And we, from a population health point of view, gave these incentives to primaries to say, take care of when and where you refer, look at drug uh, interactions, look at drug, all medications, find the sickest people in the people who are attributed to you, and develop care plans for them. We did a series of things like that. We had been running 7.5 to 8.5% up on overall cost each year for a decade mm. when we started the program. That's why we started the program. Since the program started eight years ago, it's been three and a half to four and a half percent up. We wow. cut it in half. Wow. And this includes Dramatic. drugs, yeah. which are the most rapidly rising. Mm -hmm. We have been able to cut admissions by 30%, which mm -hmm. are often indications of breakdown of chronic illness. Mm -hmm. You get admitted and readmitted as you break down. Uh, we've been able to cut emergency room use over that period of time almost as much. And so the only way we think you can do that is to maintain people at home more stable in their own environment and help them understand the management of their own conditions and illnesses. Mm -hmm. So the care coordination features of the program are designed to do that. Through now, 600 nurses that are spread out through this region working with primary care physicians. Wow. It has made a real difference, not only in cost, but in the quality of people's lives and the maintenance and stability of their life at home, as opposed to going back and forth to the hospital. You were able to achieve that savings pretty quickly. We by, were. By putting <clears throat> this program in place. Well, what happened was we thought when we started, we could notch it down a percent or so a year. So you go from, say, 9% to 8 to 7 to What happened was it dropped precipitously. Mm -hmm. um, it dropped quickly almost to uh, the level where it is now. So we have been running for all those years, 35 to 45 and percent increase with drug, as I said, which is the most volatile part of the overall equation. Mm -hmm. The result has been this more gradual rise in healthcare cost has saved our subscribers hundreds of millions of dollars that otherwise would have been, you know, had to have been built into the premium. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it's a real success story. Yeah, definitely. Um, one of the issues being discussed quite um, frequently at this conference is the opioid crisis, yes. which seems to be on everyone's mind. What is your input? Um, have you been taking part in these conversations yes. as well? Yes. Um, any strategies in place yes. at your company? We have four or five key things that we are doing. Um, 
The first is in the way opioids are prescribed. So two things are critical, and this is coming out of the policies of the uh, CDC. The first is limit the amount of dosage um, that is in any prescription. Mm -hmm. And the second is limit the duration, unless there is compelling reason to do otherwise. So what we have done uh, some months ago is set those policies in motion, and we can see changes in prescribing patterns already. Um, so you don't walk out of um, a physician's office or a hospital with a 30-day or 90-day supply. Right. Mm -hmm. um, that's one step. A second step is um, we have issued RFPs, requests for proposals, through a grant program that we started, principally aimed at new ideas in early intervention before somebody completely breaks down, usually working in partnership with local government here. We're about to issue a series of awards mm -hmm. on program innovations. But interestingly, there are several other elements that may turn out to be critically important. The first thing is um, we identified a network of substance abuse providers who are really able to follow people essentially for a year through intensive outpatient treatment and back into the community and still getting uh, treatment through the course of a year to stabilize them. Um, there are several of them in this area that we are working with who are really very good at that. And then we found out that the cost sharing in benefit designs, the amount of out-of-pocket for deductible and co-payments and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. thwarted hmm. compliance. So you may say to somebody, I think you need to do this every week you know, for the next year. Mm -hmm. And they said, that's all well and good, but I can't afford the out-of-pocket expense and therefore they don't do it. Mm -hmm. So what we did is to say, well, as long as you are compliant, cooperating with your care plan, we'll waive it. Oh. Mm -hmm. So you don't have that as long as you comply. <clears throat> and we have found that's a real incentive to people. But it takes, I guess the point I'm trying to make is, if you are seriously addicted, you may need to go through a residential or at least an intensive outpatient program. And oftentimes after that, in the typical environment, you're lost, you're on your own. Right. So what we designed the program to do is to follow you for a full year afterward, and then removed the financial obstacles mm -hmm. for you to do that. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing is that that enables people to stay in the programs longer, get more certain, steady on their feet, if you will, mm -hmm. and deal with their addiction uh, more effectively. So it's, a, it's no one thing, no. it's a combination well, it's a of these things. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. What are the questions <coughs> you're hoping will get addressed at, at the meeting, and, and what are the messages that you're hoping to leave with attendees? Today? Mm -hmm. Well, my topic is the misdiagnosis of ACA or slash Obamacare. Yeah. I think the point and points I would make is it stunningly reached a large portion of Americans. Yes. Let us not forget that. It reached the neediest, both financially and from an illness point of view. Let us not forget that. And then the message is, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Do not condemn the whole program um, if there are parts of it that need improvement. And there are many things that the Affordable Care Act got right essential health benefits and community rating and guaranteed issue, those kinds of things that we think are essentially uh, correct. Mm -hmm. The things that it got wrong, not providing enough reinsurance protection for the really high cost claims, sure. those things we think can be corrected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my message is be careful about what is set in motion and don't do things that undermine um, the, the current lay of the land. M many people don't know this, but most of the people who got covered from Obamacare got covered through Medicaid expansion. Mm -hmm. and, and another 11 to 12 million people got covered through the exchanges. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's given that 19 states did not participate. And had they, we'd have even more Americans right, covered. Right. 
Right. That's a stupendous achievement. It sure is. Mm -hmm. And so fix what's wrong. Don't throw the whole thing out. Right. And don't undermine it. Right. Okay. That's my basic message. It's a good one. A strong one. Thank you, Chet Burrell. All right. A pleasure. Thank you, Mabel. Good to be with you again. Good to meet with you. And I'm Mabel Jong. Stay <clears> with <throat> us. Much more to come. Thank you.